Hi, May. Hi, team. How are you? Let's see, Very Bob. Good. Bob, you want to go ahead and share your screen? You're welcome to put it on. Um, just real quick, let me again introduce myself. My name is May Millies. I have over 21 years of electric utility industry experience, 16 of it as a customer like you, where I worked both in distribution, transmission, and power generation, and then the most recent five years with GE Digital Crit. Um, so my team and I, we are within pre-sales. Apologies, I missed that there. Um, I lead the global pre-sales organization, and we work closely with you and our customers to map business outcomes and needs um, to the solutions that de deliver those outcomes. Um, the broader GE Digital portfolio, real quick, includes both Smart World GIS, SCADA, Advanced EMS, um, ADMS, Advanced Market Management Systems, Asset Performance Management, Prophecy Historian, and solutions for oil and gas, manufacturing, digital IoT, as well as aviation. So turbine to toaster, we have you covered. Um, I'm excited today because first you'll hear from a GE customer, Bob Duke of Alabama Power, part of Southern Company, who's going to be discussing how Fizzer and Vault Location at Alabama has really delivered them value. Um, Bob is the distribution support manager at Alabama Power, part of Southern Company Guest, where he and his team are responsible for the GE ADMS software training support, as well as the dashboard, subscription alert manager, and some outage alerts and other information that they use within the Alabama Power System, including their outage map. You may also hear from Matthew Leak, who's going to be talking about Flizzer. If you have those kinds of questions, he can dive in on those. And then just some really key areas for you and the team to focus is this presentation is packed with exciting insights and value that Alabama Power has achieved since they've deployed this real-time closed-loop flizzer to improve reliability. So some really fantastic takeaways there. Um, and then you'll also hear from my colleague, Jesse Gans, Senior Product Manager for the Renewables DER Orchestration. And he'll introduce himself further before he speaks, but just want to let you know that those are the voices you may hear. Um, and then lastly, of course, um, like Alabama and even Duke, where we've worked with them to deploy real-time closed-loop IVVO for conservation voltage reduction, my team and I look forward to the opportunity to support you. So feel free to reach out to me directly, um, utilities and consultants alike. We'd love to work with you and discuss how GE can help you solve your problems that matter. All right, with that, I'll hand it over to Bob. Hey, thanks, May. I appreciate the introduction. I hope everybody's doing well today. As May said, my name is Bob Duke. I work for Alabama Power and Power Delivery Technology. I'm here today to talk to you about Fizzler and Fault Location. Uh, you'll see on my opening slide that Melanie Miller, her name's on the presentation. Well, Melanie was going to do the presentation, but she had an unexpected conflict come up. So I'm pinch hitting for Melanie, and uh, hopefully I'll do as good a job as Melanie would have done. So with, with that, we'll go ahead and get started. And we'll talk a little bit about Alabama Power Company. Um, if you're not familiar with it, we have um, 6,600 employees, almost one and a half million customers. We have six geographic divisions. You see those pictured on the right. Uh, the area in gray at the top of the, sc the screen, at the top of the state is not part of our service territory. Uh, we have 860 distribution substations, 2,300 distribution circuits and then five different primary voltages from 4 kV to 35 kV. So where did we come from? What did our grid of the past look like? Well, the operator had a legacy OMS, a legacy DMS, and a SCADA system. They were all separate. Uh, was very inefficient for the operator to try to use all three systems. Uh, the, the operator um, didn't have the situational awareness that they needed because the systems were basically separate and he was having to do, he or she was having to do the swivel chair so we also had some field automation at the time uh, customer segmentation was about a thousand customers per block we had an older communications channel MAS was our communications channel and we have program schemes that that only restore power to people that were in the area served by the scheme so not all the customers were covered so where are we now as far as our grid modernization, well, we have four times the number of automated field devices now. Our customer segmentation, our goal is three to 400 per block. We're, we're not there yet. 
we're installing new devices every day to try to get there. Our communications channel is more modern. It's LTE and fiber. Um, we, we have an integrated operations platform now. We have GE's ADMS, Advanced Distribution Management System. We like to call it IDMS at Alabama Power. Um, I for integrated. We like to emphasize the integration between SCADA, the DMS, and the OMS. So we're building on that platform. Uh, we're now implementing the advanced applications. We have PowerFlow, Fault Location, and Fizzer in production. Um, our, our journey started back in 2012 when we implemented the DMS. In 2014, we implemented the OMS. And in the last two to three years, we started with the advanced applications. And we, we couldn't be where we are today without GE's help. GE's been a tremendous partner for us, and we really appreciate all their help in getting us where we're at today. So let's talk a little bit about Fizzer. Um, Fizzer or Flizzer, as some people call it, it's a model-based application which dynamically analyzes the system to develop restoration plans. Uh, Fizzer automatically checks for any violations before it implements a plan. It's not going to implement a plan that will cause a problem. It uses SCADA, uh, SCADA automated field devices to implement the switching steps. And some people say, well, what's the difference between Fizzer and Flizzer? Well, Flizzer fault location isolation and service restoration relies on fault location halos and Fizzer just relies on the fault targets. So at Alabama Power, what we decided to do was since the fault halos are only 90% accurate, we set up Fizzer to rely on the fault targets. And you can see an example here at the bottom where the, the breaker saw the, the fault on phase A. Uh, Fizzer thinks the faults between the breaker and the first downstream recloser, where Flizzer, because of fault location, it's off a little bit and it thinks the faults between two downstream reclosers. So what's the difference between Fizzer and Schemes? Well, a couple of huge differences are that you can use any automated field device uh, in the Fizzer plan. So there's no tying to one device manufacturer. There's no special peer-to-peer -peer communication or SCADA communications type. And the really cool part is that Fizzer uses the dynamic state of the system. So there's no model to maintain. Uh, it's even using the system when the system switched abnormal, so you're always going to get the best plan. There's also data archiving and reporting that schemes don't have, which really helps quantify the benefits of Fizzer and all the devices that are being on, installed on the system to support Fizzer. So let's walk through an example. Uh, this is an actual Fizzer restoration from July 7th, 2019. This is on the Trace Crossing substation in Birmingham. And you'll see the, the animation here on the right. The, the first thing that happened was that a switch opened de-energizing service to almost 3,000 customers. Uh, Fizzer goes to work. You see the blue lightning bolt on the ADMS geographic. Uh, when you see that lightning bolt, Fizzer's evaluating its options and going through and figuring out the best scenario for restoring service to as many customers as possible. Uh, when you see the yellow lightning bolt, Fizzer has completed um, its evaluation and it begins implementation. So with, with this example, this is going to be a four-step plan. So first, Fizzer is going to open a recloser to isolate and then close the switch to restore service to 1,748 customers. It opens another recloser to isolate and then closes another switch to pick up another 883 customers. So that leaves 259 customers that are still out out of the original 2,890. Um, so those customers aren't going to have a two to three hour outage. Uh, this all happened when it, within 175 seconds of the switch opening. So it was a big difference in time between a, a you know a few seconds outage and a, a multi hour outage. So you see our Sadie's benefits of 0.52. Um, 774,000 CMI avoided minutes, avoided lost revenue. We have a calculation that estimates avoided lost revenue. We calculated that to be about $7,000. And then the ICE impact avoided, ICE, if you're not familiar with it, is the interruption cost estimate. And this is calculated using a calculator that um, calculates the societal impact of a power outage. It's not just 
you know, the customer's power being out. It's the factory that they can't produce a good or, you know, that type thing. So it's trying to capture that, that whole economic impact, the outage. So what did our FISR implementation plan look like? Uh, we deployed roughly 60 substations every six weeks, and that, that was a good number for us. That gave our team time to clean up the model um, and do all the tasks necessary for deployment. We did decommission 242 local schemes and gave those devices to FISR. Um, it took some time to convince people ab about FISR and, and how well it would perform, but we were able to do that. Uh, FISR actually did it itself because of the great restoration work it was doing and the, the great results it provided. But you can see in the, the chart here at the bottom, this shows by each of our divisions, the number of stations and feeders on FISR, along with the approximate number of SCADA devices and approximate customers. So for the whole company, we've currently got 718 stations on FISR, uh, 1,900 feeders, almost 6,000 SCADA devices, and that, that grows daily, like I said before, and one and a half million customers. So let's talk a little bit about the model improvement that we did for FISR. Uh, we had a lot of people involved in the model cleanup. It started with DMS support. Um, that was my team with the project management, uh, also database modeling, uh, reports and scripts, research and testing, of course, training for FISR. And then with model cleanup, this is where a lot of different groups in power delivery got involved. Uh, GIS, metering, the state operations center, substation maintenance, protection and controls, and the field engineers were all involved in the model cleanup. And that really helped with the buy-in for FISR. That helped a lot with the, the change management there. And then with deployment, we had even more groups involved, the engineering support groups, the DCCs, and of course, distribution planning were involved in the deployment as well as part of the cleanup. So what did our model cleanup look like? Uh, well, we corrected bad SCADA measurements at the substations. We reviewed default fuse-sized equipment. Uh, we corrected misphased customers using AMI smart meter data. And we reviewed locations where small wire served large wire down the line. You can see an example of that on the right in the picture. You see number four ACSR feeding 795 AAC. That, that's not a good situation, but it was real in the field. So it was something that, that we had to make sure was modeled correctly. Um, and we also field checked lots of devices. Um, that's where we had the field engineers involved. They were busy helping us do that. As far as statistics for what the model cleanup looked like, uh, we had over 9,375 wire segments that were field checked and updated in GIS, uh, 1,629 default fuse sizes corrected in GIS, 443 default transformer sizes corrected in GIS, and using some AMI meter technology, we were able to have 217,306 AMI meters um, phasing corrected. Um, and those changes, those were all made in GIS, like I said, not, not in the ADMS. So other systems that consume data from the GIS, like SIM, for instance, they benefited from these model corrections. So it's not just the ADMS that benefits, it's all the other downstream systems. And there's an example here of an overloaded conductor. This was on the Magella substation. You see some number two ACSR in the middle of 397 ACSR, and you, you can see the difference in the rating, 630 amps for the 397 ACSR compared to 200 amps for the number two ACSR. So uh, that, that was something that we fixed, but we found a lot of things like this that were corrected. Um, over 76,400 power flow voltage and overload violations were corrected total. So th there was just a lot of work that a lot of people did to get the ADMS ready for FISR. So how long did our deployment take? I mentioned we were deploying roughly 60 substations every six weeks. Uh, it took us about a year and a half to deploy all 718 substations. Uh, we started in March of 2019 and finished in July of 2020. Uh, this model improvement paid dividends for more than just the advanced apps. Um, planning every year was loading data from GIS into SIM, and every year they would Screw up the data in SIM, they would never go back and make the corrections in GIS. So 
each year they spent weeks just trying to scrub their models to get ready to do their planning studies. Well, now that we've done this model cleanup, the, the GIS has clean data and it's feeding SIM and the ADMS. So SIM receives the benefits of, of all the data cleanup that was done for FISR and the other advanced apps. Um, it, it also gives us more accurate OMS predictions during storms. And we've really noticed a difference the past couple of years in, in our um, predictions and more importantly in our customer notification, our, our downstream customer communications with, you know, outage alerts with outage texting, uh, that, that's really got to be correct. So this has helped a lot with that. It's helped us identify weak points in the system, and we also have better data to make smarter system improvement decisions because we know what our model looks like. We have a much more accurate model now. So let's talk about the FISR impact. Your average FISR restoration plan restores 503 customers, avoids 233,214 CMIs, avoids $324,144 in ICE, avoids $1,589 in lost revenue. The average two-step plan takes 20 seconds to implement. The average four-step plan takes 41 seconds to implement. And the average six-step plan takes 63 seconds to implement. And yes, we have had a few six-step plans. Uh, the majority are two-step plans. We do have a good bit of four-step plans, but we have had uh, some of the six-step plans be successful. So the year-over-year -year impact of FISR, uh, looking at the chart, you can see that from 2019 through August of this year, FISR has implemented successfully almost a thousand plans and restored service to about a half million customers over these three years. Uh, you can see safety and safety avoided percentages there. Those are estimated from some calculations that we do. And of, of course, those estimates are the raw calculations without applying the, the storm exclusions. Those do sometimes get reduced for storm exclusions. And FISR, over the life of FISR, since it's been in production, has helped avoid 217 million CMI. So it's it's doing great work. We're really happy with FISR. And just to dive into FISR a little bit more to look at the impact of a storm month versus a blue sky month, um, we picked October 2020 as our storm month. That was a month that we had a really big hurricane, actually our biggest hurricane since we've been on ADMS, Hurricane Zeta. You see it pictured on the right, the, the path that it took through Alabama power system. Um, you see little stars in each of the divisions and those stars correspond to FISA restorations. Um, during the month of October, this was more than just Zeta. We had 104 successful FISA plans restoring service to 57,000 customers, avoiding 81 million CMIs and you see the calculated total impact for safety and safety of 6.65%, 7.3%. Once you apply the storm exclusions, those get reduced. But at the end of the day, the, the customer doesn't care about storm exclusions. They care about their lights being back on. So, so they were happy, even though you know it didn't really impact our reliability numbers a lot with the storm exclusions. Uh, comparing that to July of 2021, a month where we didn't have any storm exclusions, FISR implemented 61 plans successfully restoring service to almost 29,000 customers. Uh, you see the SADI and safety improvement, 13.9% for SADI and 11.2% for safety. So FISR is making a difference every day in the work that it's doing on, on both stormy days and blue sky days. So if you take a look at the breakdown of devices used in FISR plans, uh, the chart on the right, uh, the blue piece of the pie, are non-scheme devices that were, were never used before um, as part of the old schemes that we had. So 68% of the time, FISR found plans using devices that were never part of decommissioned schemes. Um, 18% of the time, FISR found a better plan than the decommissioned scheme would have found. That's that's really impressive that it used both non-scheme and scheme devices to implement a better solution than what the old scheme would have. Um, so next we have a chart. Uh, this chart 
plots the successful fissure restorations versus the number of fissure stations deployed. The solid orange line is the restorations and the blue is, are the stations deployed. And you can see, like I said before, our deployment started in March of 2019 and finished in July of 2020. Uh, you see some spikes in the data in April of 2020 when we had several tornadoes that month. And then again in September and October of 2020 when we had Hurricane Sally and Zeta in back-to-back -back months. So shifting gears to talk about fault location. Um, fault location paints halos on the AG ADMS geographic to help operators direct crew patrols. And these halos are based on calculations from SCADA reported data from field devices. Um, fault location needs fault magnitude and fault targets uh, to do its calculations. This data comes from distribution feeder relays, from reclosers, and from line fault indicators. And since fault location has been deployed at Alabama Power, it's painted roughly 54,000 halos on the ADMS geographic. And it's, it's hard to measure the accuracy here. We, we did that through surveys of, of field personnel and operators, and we found that these are about 90% accurate. Uh, we did some approximations to, to calculate the reduced patrol distance. Uh, we, we think it's around 1.8 miles. Uh, and reduces the patrol amount by 66%. The outage duration is reduced by roughly 8%. And in total, these fault location halos to help APC avoid 15,346 miles of crew patrols and 155 million CMIs. You'll see on the picture here in the right, this, there's a picture inside a picture of a, a snake that we found on the bottom phase of the primary during a breaker outage in 2019. And the fault location really helped, helped us find this snake a lot faster. It, it really proved its worth here. Uh, that, that was a difficult outage to find. You know, looking up at the pole, you can see that you know, it was hard to see that snake there. But fault location told the, the crews where to, where to look and they quickly found the problem. So how did we get the data needed for fault location? Well, we started by reviewing each distribution feeder. As I said before, fault location needs fault magnitude and fault targets. Um, not all the feeders had that data available. Some of the relays were older. So we decided the most economical solution for us was to install fault indicators on the feeders that couldn't report the necessary data. Um, the, the data returned by these sensors was used not only by fault location, but also FISR. FISR needs the fault targets. And the way that works, you see the picture here where the, the fault um, indicator communicates over LTE to the AMPL server and AMPL feeds ADMS. ADMS, of course, has fault location and FISR. Uh, AMPL also provides analytics to engineers, so they're able to benefit from the waveforms and, and do some further analysis than, than what fault location would do in determining the fault location. So. We've had really good luck with these sensors. We're in the process of installing them now. Uh, approximately 4,000 fault indicators will be installed by the end of the year, and those will be on about 1,300 feeders. So some of the benefits of the fault indicators are that they're more time efficient to install than upgrading the relays. Uh, you can also move them around if you want to. Uh, sensors can report fault data without a breaker trip. Uh, the AMPL software can be leveraged by the reliability engineers, and then the firmware meets cybersecurity standards. And here's a picture of another fault location example. This is a case where fault location greatly reduced the patrol distance almost 80% to find a tree which pulled down the primary. So our, our future work that we're looking at, uh, there are more advanced applications in the, the GE ADMS. There's load fault bar management that we'd like to implement, surgical load shed, protection validation, and also short circuit calculation. So we, we've got a lot of work to do there. Um, we're also looking at distributed energy resources. I think Jesse's gonna talk a little bit about that more in a minute. We wanna figure out what their impact is on the ADMS and the power flow calculations and the FISR plans. And also we're working on modeling for solar and wind, um, trying to get the model down in the ADMS. And 
one big thing that we've started this year, uh, we're, we're on IDMS or ADMS 386 right now. We, we actually implemented 386 last year during the pandemic. Uh, the previous speaker was, was talking about you know, how difficult it was to work during the pandemic, but our team was able to implement a new version of ADMS and also upgrade SCADA both last year while also working two hurricanes, uh, Sally and Zeta, including the, the largest hurricane Zeta, which has ever impacted our system since we've had ADMS. Um, but what we want to do is, is start uh, constant testing of current dev, the most current release, so we can provide GE feedback in more real time, so it makes it easier for us to upgrade. And our current plan is to upgrade from SCADA 3.2 to 3.4 next year and from ADMS 3.86 to 3.13. We're well on our way to that, that goal now. Um, and testing current dev has made a big difference. Just wanted to say a, a few words about change management. Um, it's important to have everyone involved and explain why we're making changes. Uh, it's important to have your operators, linemen, engineers, and super supervisors all uh, involved so that they know, you know, for example, why we're switching to FISR instead of the local schemes, uh, how FISR is going to impact them in the field when they're working outages. We want to have continuous discussions on the benefits. Um, you know, for fault location, you have reduced patrol time looking for an outage. For FISR, you have reduced outage time for customers or even you know, no outages in some cases. And soon after we implemented fault location uh, alignment in Eastern Division, he made a comment. He said that fault location gets me home to my family faster. And, and that comment really from the people getting the lights on in the field that, that really hit home with, with me and my team that, that they're actually seeing the value of these advanced applications. Um, they, they've gotten where they, they ask the operator you know, where's the fault? They, they don't try to go patrol first. They, they see what ADMS, what fault location is saying. And also along the lines of change management, it's important to have reports created to show the benefits of the, the new technology. Uh, we had some FISR reports that, that showed the benefits of what, what FISR was doing. Those reports help build confidence in the new technology, and they also motivate the team to push forward to the full deployment. So in, in summary, Alabama Power is installing more field automation, allowing segmentation of customers into smaller blocks and is taking advantage of the advanced apps that are part of the ADMS. Uh, Fizzers made an impressive impact. The entire system is a scheme. We've got double digit safety and safety improvements, which is fantastic. Uh, the plans implement pretty quickly, about 20 seconds for a two-step plan. Uh, the model improvement was worth the effort, not only for the ADMS, but for other applications like SIM as well. And fault location helps reduce patrol time for the personnel out in the field working to get the lights back on. Um, it's definitely the unsung hero of the advanced apps. So with that, Jesse, I think I'm going to turn it over to you now for the, for the next session, and then we're going to finish up with questions. Yeah, thank you, Bob. That was a great presentation. Um, so like Bob said, we're going to take questions after my presentation. Um, and I'm going to switch gears a bit and talk about distributed energy resources and advanced inverters and um, what their impact is on grid operations and, and how they can be leveraged in grid operations um, with the ADMS. So, uh, like I said, my name is Jesse Gantz. I'm a senior product manager for GE's Renewables and DR Orchestration Solution. Uh, my role um, uh, extends across our uh, transmission and distribution asset management and asset control products, including ADMS, AEMS, market management systems, GIS, uh, as well as our DERM specific components that supplement those uh, applications. And um, I have a background in power systems engineering. I've kind of been in a couple different roles. Um, at GE, I've been uh, responsible for delivery of ADMS and, and DERM solution. Um, I've worked in a, a software engineering uh, department as a development lead. I've worked for an aggregator for four years, so I've, I've kind of been on the, uh, the other side of the, the customer meter for a while, and now I'm in this role as a product manager. <clears throat> 
So just to start with some basics here, uh, get everybody um, uh, oriented. Uh, so what do we mean when we say a distributed energy resource? Um, so uh, this is located on the um, electric utility distribution system, and it can be either uh, in front of the meter or behind the meter. Um, this may include um, energy storage, intermittent generation, uh, distributed generation, like a you know a standby gas or diesel generator. It can be a, a demand response uh, or flexible load solution, uh, thermal storage, or electric vehicles and their and their charging equipment. Um, it may or may not be telemetered or dispatchable. So the little icons there kind of cheat sheet. We got solar, EV charging, battery storage, backup generation, and a smart thermostat. Uh, what do we mean by an advanced inverter? So inverters, as we know, convert DC to AC um, to allow for grid interconnection of solar PV, battery energy storage, electric vehicles that are, um, you know, DC energy sources. Um, just a, a reminder for the folks that, you know, have a background in electrical engineering, um, what these inverters doing is they're actually synthesizing the AC waveform. Um, and why that's important is um, you're able to flexibly kind of create whatever relationship between the current and voltage you want as you as you create those sinusoids. So that creates a lot of capability for the inverters to to manipulate the real and reactive power um, to to very quickly respond to local grid conditions and provide support. And we'll talk about that in more detail. Um, but if we if we use the word advanced in front of the inverter, that typically means there's communications and control capabilities built into them. And a, a lot of equipment have them out of the box, even though they may not be utilized um, by the customer or the utility. <clears throat> um, and, and finally, advanced inverters are being incorporated in codes and standards like uh, IEEE 1547, which is the DR interconnection standard um, in the United States, uh, UL 1741. And in some uh, regions, such as California, Rule 21, they're, they're mandated for each new DR interconnection. So uh, this is just a quick recap on what are DR and what, are, what do we mean by advanced inverters. <clears throat> Next, uh, let's talk a little bit about how DR can affect grid operations. So this is just a, a brief list. Uh, there's, there's more ways that they can affect, but I'm, I'm focusing on a couple areas that are um, most salient. So I think that one of the key areas is masked load. So if from a typical distribution operations or grid operations standpoint, um, you have loading information typically at the feeder head or the substation um, via SCADA. Um, and you know this traditionally has represented the actual load on the grid, um, where now if you have more distribution connected uh, energy sources, some of that load is being fed locally. Um, so what you're seeing through SCADA no longer represents the actual load on the grid. Um, this makes it more difficult to forecast um, loading conditions because there's a portion of it that's, you know, the is affected by say the solar PV output um, or EV charging behavior. Um, and then in situations where that DR trips offline, such as like a voltage or frequency event, um, that full uh, native load will need to be restored and served. Um, and so that's something that needs to be considered in, in switching and outage restoration is what is the actual load? So understanding what that um, masked load is and the disaggregation of the load and the generation is a, is a key capability in your ADMS system. Um, and this is, this is something that needs to be built into the ADMS that has the full knowledge of the network topology, has all of the loading information, has the dynamic switching conditions. Um, so it's, it really cannot be um, uh, pulled out of the ADMS. Um, it should be, it becomes part of your day-to-day -day operations to understand this mass load. Um, the, the next area is um, obviously DR or um, in many cases, injecting power back into the grid. This creates reverse flow at different portions of the network. That could just be on your secondaries. It could go up into the primary network or back through the distribution substation into the subtransmission network, and that can change throughout the day. So um, this, this can cause uh, 
challenges in, in, in terms of grid operations. Um, you may have certain equipment that may be non-reversible um, or protection schemes that are assuming a particular direction of flow um, that need to be replaced uh, if, if reverse flow happens. Um, and then another phenomenon is that, you know, the end of line voltages um, can start to rise now as you have higher DR output um, and during periods of low load, um, your traditional regulation equipment like capacitor banks and tap changing transformers aren't really designed to manage those um, those injections at the end of the line and the fact that voltage might be rising. So this diagram on the right here shows kind of before DG, you had typical load drop as you left the substation and, and got closer to the end of the feeder. But after you incorporate DG, um, you can start to see uh, voltage rise. And so, you know, many of these challenges are mitigated through the interconnection process um, and studies that are done um, to um, ensure that DG don't um, cause these adverse effects. Um, but as the penetration of DR increases and as there's more public demand to interconnect DG, um, <clears throat> there's there's need for first analyzing these situations and, and managing them in real time. So um, from a planning perspective, there's the ability to quickly process interconnections um, and identify if there's any kind of active solutions for managing, say, high voltage um, or um, reverse flow, and, and including that in the interconnection process. And then from the operation standpoint, there's the, um, the awareness of these programs or the, the active management of uh, voltage, say, for instance, in uh, volt bar optimization to, um, to manage voltage using um, maybe what might be customer equipment. Um, and then finally, in, in short terms of short circuit and, and protection um, analysis and, and settings, DR can have an impact in terms of short circuit calculations. Um, and this can be for both, and it's different for spinning machines and inverter connected DR, right? They can, um, they have a particular contribution to fault, um, which is not from transmission. Uh, and then finally, DR uh, uh, have internal protection uh, equipment themselves, which is required for the interconnection. And more and more, there these settings in those local protection um, equipment can um, have an impact on the grid. So they need to be understood and modeled in the ADMS. So um, from a GE standpoint, this these are real world phenomena that need to be part of your day to day operations and are the ability to manage these situations are part of the, the ADMS. Uh, itself. So that requires modeling of DR, uh, incorporation of DR injections and power flow, forecasting of DR output, um, understanding end of line voltages and, um, and, and protection. Okay, um, now if I go to more um, proactive how DR can support grid operations <clears throat> as opposed to just how are they affecting operations currently? DR, like I said earlier, um, particularly for inverter connected DR, um, have the ability to quickly um, manage real and reactive power. Um, and what this means is in terms of say voltage, the ability to quickly um, change your power factor or reactive power injection um, to act like a capacitor bank or like in, in um, uh, a reactor and, and pull down that high voltage or prop up the low voltage. Um, so that could be done through a centralized uh, volt VAR optimization scheme, and that's part of the GVBO, uh, or it can be done locally at the inverter um, through these local autonomous control modes. So um, what I'm showing in this picture here is what's called the volt VAR curve, where um, the locally sensed system voltage um, is uh, is used to to manage the VAR injection of the DR itself. Um, so so again, there's this is just one example of the types of um, capabilities that are built into the inverters. Another one is the ability to manage um, uh, or to accept a, a real power limit 
so a do not exceed uh, export limit, for instance, or import limit for a battery, um, that uh, it can it can guarantee that your solar PV will not exceed a certain output for a certain period of time. So that's again a capability of the inverter itself. Um, inverters can also be configured to respond to bulk grid issues like um, frequency. So if there's uh, a frequency event, frequency goes high, inverters can be configured like an under frequency load shed to um, reduce or increase output based on that frequency. Um, you know, another example is what's called renewable smoothing. So the ability to manage intermittency of say solar or wind in particular um, using uh, inverter control or energy storage. Um, in terms of the capacity, so this is a big area of, of investment and you see a lot of what are called non-wires alternatives uh, to managing uh, grid capacity challenges. Uh, so the idea is that you can um, either deploy your own DR or contract with third party DR providers or aggregators to have uh, the resources available to manage peak load um, to um, to get through those periods of times when you needed that capacity. Um, so this is really around capacity deferral. Um, there's also the ability to use the DR to uh, reduce your exposure to wholesale market prices. Uh, and spikes. So if, if there's a high price period similar to demand response, you can now discharge a battery, um, change solar output to uh, affect that uh, exposure to those, those prices. Uh, from outage restoration standpoint, obviously microgrids are exciting and that they allow critical customers to have continuity of supply when the network is down, um, but they can also be leveraged in the ADMS, whether it's from a monitoring standpoint or um, interactive control and GE has both the, the microgrid controller and the ADMS and the ability to integrate between the two. Um, and then switching applications, uh, like I said, they need to be aware of DR that are disconnecting and reconnecting uh, due to um, switching, but they can also use DR to say manage cold load or to um, uh, prevent reconnection of DR that that might be adverse to like a, a new topology. Um, so this is in the context of outage restoration and, and from telemetry, um, DR provide a, a local source for telemetry. A lot of inverter connected DR have them, that metering in place. And if you have the remote communications to them, you can use them to get that kind of last mile visibility uh, and that can help with power flow uh, in your distribution state estimation. So this is, we talked about ways that DR affect the grid, ways that they can be used to support the grid. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how DR can be incorporated into your operation system. So they're they're different than traditional utility assets. Um, they're often owned by a third party, like a customer or an aggregator. To understand how they can be utilized, you need both the technical um, information as well as maybe contractual or interconnection uh, agreement information. And then they're going to be changing over time is that you, you see that um, those contracts changing, the availability changing. And a lot of the smaller ones are not going to be connected over your SCADA communications network. So you might need to leverage either public internet or AMI communications network. So this is, these are ways that they're different than traditional grid assets. And then there's just a lot of them coming online, depending on you know, your area of the world, um, DR can present a huge challenge in terms of the volume that need to be interconnected to the network, um, say every month. So, um, so we have the ability to register and manage DR um, from kind of the offline business systems and bring in some of that um, non-traditional, say contractual information into the operation space so that when you dispatch a DR, you know that you're respecting those operational limits. It can't be dispatched more than 15 times a month or it can't be dispatched on weekends. So um, that needs to be incorporated in the, the operations side. Uh, and I wanna talk a little bit now about one particular protocol, which is IEEE 2030.5. Um, it's, it's designed for communications with the DER. It's a modern and web service based uh, communications it's a uh, it's
different than SCADA communication protocols, even though it's designed for communication with energy equipment, um, in that it has a, a rich data model and some advanced capabilities for communicating in particular with inverter connected devices. Um, it's been growing in popul popularity over the years. It's one of the named protocols in 1547. It's been mandated in California for all new DR interconnections. Uh, for meeting a communications and control requirement. Um, and it allows for communications from the utility to an aggregator or directly to a DR uh, system. And it really unlocks a lot of that advanced capability I was talking about. So behind the meter, maybe customer owned equipment is now available as a, as a grid resource. Um, and so there's what's called the common smart inverter profile. So this is a, a profile of the protocol that defines guidelines for implementation as well as specific requirements for inverters or aggregators um, to standardize the data that's exchanged and to, to enable interoperability. So there's a, a third party called the SunSpec Alliance that G is a member of um, that is managing that certification process and ensuring that servers, aggregators, and clients all um, meet these criteria. But if we look at what that means, it means um, DER are going to be expected to provide this information um, to the server, to the utility, and to support these controls. Um, so in, in thinking in comparison to SCADA, it's really going above and beyond what's available there. So it's the devices can report their nameplate ratings as well as their kind of dynamic or um, you know maybe derated settings for their equipment um, they can report information about connected status um, alarms um, operational modes uh, and they're also reporting um, analog values like per phase voltage watts bars frequency um, so these would be kind of similar to SCADA point that would be pulled back but with addition of that uh, nameplate information and settings. And then from a control standpoint, CSIP defines uh, the ability to connect or disconnect the asset, um, support real power targets or real power limits, um, define power factor set points, uh, ramp rates on DR. And then there's a whole host of advanced capabilities that are defined through a, a, a control curve or set of settings. Um, some of them are protection based, like low and high voltage uh, or frequency ride through settings or uh, local regulation like that volt bar or frequency watt regulation I mentioned earlier. And one more thing is that from a utility standpoint, you can group these controls by network topology, say all DR under the substation or all DR that are um, uh, participating in this particular program. Um, to be dispatched as a single control group. So it supports that scalability in terms of managing thousands and thousands of DR. Um, so this is a, a protocol that G's um, supporting and we have product to implement that and bring that capability into the ADMS. Um, so if we look here from an architecture standpoint, we have DR monitoring and dispatch in the ADMS and communication to large DR via SCADA communications and front ends, um, but then we have the ability to use this 23.5 gateway to communicate with either aggregators or with directly with DR. Um, and that can enable that behind the meter DR communication. And then there's a registration and offline process associated with that to, um, to manage that change and have, have quality in bringing those devices on the network. Uh, so with that, that can, concludes my presentation. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and I think we're going to turn it over for questions now. Thank you, Jesse. Greg here, everybody. Let's uh, have some questions here. May, do you want to jump in and and uh, do anything or should I just uh, Drop the first Hi, question. Yeah, I think we answered all the questions in the chat. So if there's any other questions for Jesse. 
Well, there was a question about a mix of software versus hardware do you need for the Fleaser to work? Yes, sir. Hey, this is Matthew League. Um, I'm here with Bob, and Bob, if it's okay with you, I'm glad to take that question. Okay. Great. Beautiful. Yeah, that's right. So one of the great things about Fizzer is that because it's integrated into the GE ADMS, there's actually no separate hardware or model that we have to, to maintain, if you will. Um, so, so, so the Fizzer itself, it, it, it's monitoring the DMS and SCADA. So it's actually seeing the same information that the operators are. And, and that makes it obviously very, very powerful. So, so when something is, is, is abnormally fed, when you have switches open, switches closed, you have something tagged, then the Fizzer is, the Fizzer is able to see that. Um, and as Bob mentioned in the PowerPoint uh, a little while ago, um, because Fizzer is using the SCADA communications, it actually doesn't really care what it's talking to necessarily. Uh, it doesn't care if it's, say, say a Schweitzer, an Eaton, um, you know, a, 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 an SNC, and it doesn't care what device it is. As long as it has SCADA controls to it, the Fizzer, the, the Fizzer is able to access it, is able to control it. So that's something that I really appreciate uh, about Fizzer itself is that in in contrast to, say, schemes or some, 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 uh, some other, other centralized uh, devices that are used to uh, to uh, to switch to switch to restore customers, Fizzer itself is is very integrated. So there's not a whole lot of hardware that needs to be set up. As long as you have uh, the ADMS set up, uh, then the, the the setting up the Fizzer shouldn't be too difficult. So it's very powerful. Hopefully, I answered the question well. <laughs> Another Any one other was... questions, Greg? Okay. Yeah, I, I have another one that was uh, handed to me that was different. How do you test the algorithm and train the operators before rolling out Fizzer? Absolutely, and that's, that's a great question. So, um, so for 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 us here in Alabama, I, I know that there there were some concerns because we we really did really hadn't had a system like Fizzer before. Um, and the engineering, the operators, you know, there, there was concern saying, hey, how do I make sure that Fizzer it won't switch on top of me if I have crews out there? What happens during a storm? You know, so so, th so there are some questions about how Fizzer worked, especially with the idea that now your entire system is a scheme. Any recloser, any switch out there that is in ADMS, that, that's something that Fizzer has access to, which is incredibly powerful. But again, from the operator standpoint and the engineer standpoint, they wanted to really see it put hands on it. So the way that we approached that, um, we actually did that in in two in two phases. Uh, the first way, the first one was that the the advanced applications engineers, uh, myself and a few others, we, we sat down in the the dots system, which is the the simulator, and we essentially took a copy of, of our, our production system, and we, we put it on the simulator, and we, we essentially we, we tried to to spoof Fizzer. We said, hey Fizzer, what if I got a fault here and here? What's going to happen? We would we, 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 we watch Fizzer as it evaluated and we actually implemented plans. And we spent months just hammering on it. What if we have bad SCADA measurements? What if this one is suspect and the fault happens? What happens if I have a hot tag here and a tag here? So we, we got very confident in the algorithm itself because we could actually see we actually see what Fizzer would do in the event that we have of having weird scenarios. The second part that we did for the testing and training was we also wanted to get some input from the operators and engineers. So we actually went out to the, the our control centers. Uh, to the engineering offices, and we actually sat down with with the teams there, and we and we and we showed them we showed them Fizzer in the simulator, and we said, let's let's actually walk through it. You have concerns? Let's actually let's actually let's let you put hands on Fizzer. Let's play with it, and we would get suggestions saying, hey Matthew, what happens if I have again a fault here? What if something goes wrong? What if I'm switching over here? And we would say, I don't know. Let's find out. So so we so we they really got a lot of confidence being built, and actually seeing Fizzer how it would work before we put it in production. So. So when we, when we did go live with our pilot uh, a few months later, the the crews, the well, not the crews, but the the operators, engineers, they had seen it, they had put hands on it, they and they felt a lot more comfortable with the training that they had. Very good, Mark. I'm going to go with your question first because it follows on, and then Frank, I'll get to yours. From Mark Sachs, how how have you modified your organization, number of support people? new roles, et cetera, to support Fizer. And that is also a great question. So the the main change that we had as far as support people um, is that we hired uh, two engineers to to support advanced applications. Uh, so so it, it was myself and, and another engineer. Um, and of course, with advanced applications in GE, there's more than just Fizer, right? There's power flow, fault location, um, 
uh, the a AFR plus. There's a, a, there's a whole lot more out there. But but the philosophy that we had at, at Alabama is that we really don't want to have um, we don't want to have a analysts inside an, an ivory tower maintaining the entire model. We, we really want to have the engineers in the field who, who are out there every day, the operators who switch the system every day, the planning engineers, they're the ones that we that we, we really want to enable and empower to understand Fizzer and to, to maintain it and to help us deploy it. Uh, and the, the, the idea is that no matter how good I am as an engineer, I am never going to be as good as, as the engineer that has boots on the ground in their area or the operator that switches their system every day. So especially if something goes wrong, if, if we have something wrong with the model, if we have something you know that that needs to be pushed out, we 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 really want that to come from the grassroots up. So the two engineers that we have uh, for advanced applications, the, we the goal is to have them be, be the experts. So if it's, if it's something that's really unusual, really weird, then then we can rely on them. But we, we try very hard to have this come from the grassroots up. So we empower those in the field, because at the end of the day, something I, I, would, I would tell them in, in my presentations is that. This, this, this is not the fizzer that belongs to, say, Bob Duke. This is not the fizzer that belongs to Matthew. This is your fizzer in your area. You know, so, and that's something that we, we try very hard to have as, as a philosophy at the company. One more question then on, uh, uh, on that. It's about uh, the IEEE 2030. When did IEEE 2030.5 get implemented? And what year can it be safely assumed that inverters carry the necessary technology to accommodate remote management? Yeah, great question, Frank. Um, so the 23.5 protocol has a, a long history, so it was developed first as a Zigbee um, uh, protocol designed for a kind of home area network communications inside smart homes. Um, it later became the smart energy profile um, protocol, and then that was uh, published as SCP uh, 2.0 in 2013. Um, and then uh, the 23.5 protocol was published in first the 2013 standard, and then later in a 2018 version. Um, so it's been around for a while, um, and it was mandated in in California uh, or selected in for Rule 21 in California in in uh, mid 2016. So it's been around for a while. Um, the there's a large number of inverters that support 23.5 um, and more and more um, as they it, as utilities are adopting it and it's being mandated in different uh, regions there's the california energy commission has a list of uh, inverter manufacturers and their models that that support 23.5 um, and the csip uh, profile as um, to uh, inform installers when they're making decisions. So um, it's definitely becoming a reality. Um, oftentimes inverters support Modbus um, and would prefer that. It's kind of simpler, um, but it's 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 very important to kind of work with your regulators to um, make 23.5 uh, either an option or uh, a priority or mandated in your your state or your jurisdiction for um, for interconnection of DR. Um, because the easy path is, oh, let's not add any communications or controls when these are interconnected. But if you can get it part of a um, uh, regulation that it's mandated for interconnection, then um, you have that in your, your toolbox. So what control capabilities do inverters provide today and possibly into the future? Uh, yeah, so... They're like like we discussed the ability to manage real or reactive power. Um, so this is power set points, you know, charge set points for batteries, charge limiting for electric vehicles. Um, this is you know fast local response to to grid conditions to to regulate voltage or or um, reactive power. And then there's the that reactive power component that can be used for managing. Uh, voltage, so power factor or K bar set points. Anything else, um, May? I think we're set. Thank you for your time, team. We appreciate it. Is there any more questions on the thing? I hope that helped. Let's see. I've, Matthew, I wanted to take a, and, and especially call you out for a thank you for monitoring all these questions during the middle of the session. That was uh, a nice way of being able to do it. 
I think I learned something on that and I might just be better at my own job because of this.